the nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, IMF head of communications comments on Sri Lanka's economy. She says that macroeconomic policies in Sri Lanka are starting to bear fruit. The United States Embassy in Colombo to host Indo-Pacific Business Forum with the motive of driving sustainable development in the port sector. The stock market concludes the week with today being the only day in the green. And the Japanese economy contracted at an annual rate of 2% in the first quarter of this year. From Studio 24, here's Sina Mayadune. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The IMF in a press briefing yesterday in Washington DC advised that in a shocking prone world, economies must be more resilient individually and collectively. Julie Kozak, the head of the communications department at the International Monetary Fund, commented that with respect to Sri Lanka's economic performance, macroeconomic policies in the country are starting to bear fruit. According to IMF research, cooperation is critical, but greater protectionism could lead into fragmentation and even split nations into rival blocs just as fresh shocks expose the global economy's fragility. Cossack stated that with respect to Sri Lanka's economic performance, macroeconomic policies in Sri Lanka are starting to bear fruit. Commendable outcomes include a rapid decline in inflation, robust reserve accumulation, and initial signs of economic growth while also preserving stability in the financial system. She added that overall, program performance has been strong and the next steps with respect to debt restructuring are to conclude negotiations with external private creditors and to implement the agreements in principle with Sri Lanka's official creditors. Moreover, she also mentioned that Sri Lanka's domestic debt operations are largely completed and the initial debt restructuring negotiations with external bondholders ended in mid-April without an agreement and discussions are continuing with a view to reaching an agreement in principle. <laughs> The U.S. Embassy in Colombo is set to host a satellite event of the Indo-Pacific Business Forum under the theme Driving Sustainable Development in the Port Sector on the 21st of May 2024. The event will take place concurrently with the 6th Indo-Pacific Business Forum in Manila, Philippines, co-hosted by the U.S. Trade Development Agency and the Government of Philippines in the partnership with the U.S. Department of State. Businesses and stakeholders from across the Indo-Pacific region are invited to participate in this significant event. Sri Lanka Ports Authority, together with the Minister of Ports, Shipping and Aviation, seeks to transform the nation's port into an efficient, sustainable facilities through a greening initiative. The U.S. government's support for Sri Lanka's ports sector is robust and expanding, the largest contribution being a U.S. International Development Finance Corporation investment of $553 million supporting the development of the West Container Terminal. The event will be held at Courtyard by Marriott and will include speakers from diplomatic community, Sri Lanka and Maldivian government representatives and the private sector industry leaders from ports, shipping and logistics sector. The Consumer Affairs Authority said that Sri Lanka's consumers should be more aware and vigilant when purchasing goods through online platforms and e-marketing methods. Assistant Director of the Consumer Affairs Authority, Janika Prasad, said that there can be any number of laws in the country, but it will be useless if consumers aren't aware of the legal recourse. He mentioned the consumer plays an important role in navigating a fast-evolving marketplace. Moreover, the ability to read is not sufficient and consumers have to be able to comprehend, he said. Remarking further, he added that cognizance is lacking in Sri Lankan consumers when you compare with the rest of the world and Sri Lanka's consumers must make sure to protect their money. Most of the complaints we receive are not about essential items. The International Monetary Fund Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva said in a statement earlier this week that artificial intelligence is hitting the global labour market like a tsunami. Artificial intelligence is likely to impact 60% of the jobs in advanced economies and 40% of jobs around the world in the next two years, Georgieva told in an event in Zurich. We have a very little time to get people ready for it and also businesses ready for it, she told the event organised by the Swiss Institute of International Studies associated to the University of Zurich. She added that it could bring tremendous increase in productivity if we manage it well, but it can also lead to more misinformation and of course more inequality in our society. Georgieva said that world economy had become more prone to shocks in recent years, citing the global pandemic in 2020 as well as the war in Ukraine. Although she said that she expected more shocks, particularly due to the climate crisis, remain remarkably resilient. 
resumption of passenger ferry service between Nagapatnam in India and the Kankasan Ture region near Jaffna in the northern province of Sri Lanka has been delayed again for an indefinite period. The statement was given by the Aviation Minister Nima Siripala de Silva. The passenger ferry service between Nagapatnam in Tamil Nadu and Kankasanthuri suburb of Jaffna district, which was to resume on the 13th of May, was delayed due to a technical shortcoming and was supposed to be resumed today, the 17th of May. The tickets purchased for travels from the 13th to the 16th of May was also rescheduled to happen on the 17th of May. The nature of the technical shortcoming was not revealed by the minister. The service, launched in October last year after nearly 40 years, was halted a few days later owing to rough weather. Since then, the resumption of the service, which is a vital component of India's Sri Lanka Maritime Corporation, has been delayed three times. India has also extended a grant assistance of 63.65 million US dollars, the entire project cost, to Sri Lanka to rehabilitate the Kankasanthuri port in the northern province. <laughs> A short commercial break now, let's take a look at how the stock market ended the week right after this. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. After four consecutive days of recording lows, the Colombo Stock Exchange finally concluded a day of trading with gains. Both the All Share Price Index and the S&P SL20 Index ended the day in the green, marking the last trading day of the week as the only positive one. For a detailed breakdown, we turn to Kanushka Jayatessa from SC Securities. Yes. In today's market, the All Share Price Index closed at 12,313 points, marking a 54 points increase, while the S&P SL20 ended at 3,646 points, showing an increase of 12 points from the previous session. Total trading volume reached 82 million shares with a turnover of 1.2 billion rupees. The top gainers for the day were Nations Lanka Finance, Abans Electricals, and Deep Products. Top losers for the day were Blue Diamonds Jewelry Non-Voting, Lanka Ventures Rights, and Tess Agro Non-Voting. Cooperative insurance company Amana Bank, Browns Investments, recorded the highest share volumes, while the valuable Power Eratna, Ceylon Coal Stores, Pan Asia Banking Corporation led in turnovers. Notable crossings include Amana Bank with 14.4 million shares at 33 million rupees, Haley's Fabric with 500,000 shares trading at 21 million rupees, DFCC Bank with 250,000 shares trading at 20 million rupees. It has been quite a week at the Colombo Stock Exchange, with negativity dominating most of it. However, the week ended on a positive note. For a wrap-up of this week's stock market's behaviour, let's connect with Tanusha Ashokgar from First Capital Holdings. So the stock market displayed a dull sentiment throughout the week with a nearly 260-point drop during the first four days as profit-taking was observed on selected counters such as banks and blue chips. However, the all-share price index closed the week on a positive note gaining 60 points to reach 12,320, while the S&P SL20 index also closed marginally higher by 4 points. However, comparing the week-on-week, -week, ASPI fell by 1.6% as selling pressure dominated the market during the week. Despite the bearish market, there was a notable interest observed on selected counters such as Ceylon Tobacco Company, Chevron Lubricants and Haley's Fabric following the strong year-over-year -year performance shown in earnings during the March quarter. In terms of activities, turnover slightly decreased on a weekly basis with the average weekly turnover standing at LCAT 2.2 billion compared to the LCAT 2.4 billion recorded last week as retail participation remained subdued. However, Notable foreign participation was observed during the week with significant foreign buying evident during the midweek on ambient capital amounting to LCAD 912 million. Meanwhile, notable selling pressure was evident on John Kills Holdings amounted to LCAD 380 million. 
Gold prices fell slightly today, trimming some of their gains for the week as comments from a slew of Federal Reserve officials offered a more sobering outlook on the interest rate cuts. The yellow metal had risen to nearly $2,400 an ounce this week in the immediate aftermath of some soft U.S. economic readings. But it did pull back from these levels yesterday and today. Spot gold steadied at $2,377.40 an ounce, while gold futures expiring in June fell slightly to $2,381.10 an ounce. Gold retreats as Fed officials downplay rate cuts, but weekly gains do. The yellow metal falling yesterday after a string of Fed officials cautioned against bets on immediate reductions in interest rates. Oil prices saw little movement today but were on track for a mildly positive week. A softer US dollar, declining US inventories and increased Chinese stimulus measures have raised hopes of improving demand. However, crude markets have been grappling with mixed signals this week. Brent crude futures for July delivery edged up 0.1% to $83.33 per barrel, while West Texas Intermediate crude steadied around $78.80 per barrel. For the week, Brent and WTI futures gained between 0.7% and 1.4%, with most of the gains coming yesterday after softer than expected US consumer inflation data. According to the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan rupee has appreciated slightly against the US dollar today in comparison to yesterday. Accordingly, the buying rate of the US dollar has dropped from 297 rupees and 31 cents to 295 rupees and 80 cents, while the selling rate has dropped from 307 rupees and 3 cents to 305 rupees and 15 cents. Let's have a look at how the rupee behaved against the global currencies. Moving on to a short commercial break, this is an Ali Business Report. Welcome back to the Nile Business Report. SLT Mobital has reported a flat growth in Q1 2024, ending March 31st this year, amidst a challenging business environment. However, the company's proactive cost management initiatives have resulted in significant operational cost savings, enabling it to maintain profitability. For the quarter, the SLT Group has recorded consolidated revenue of 26.93 billion rupees, reflecting a marginal 1.4% year-on-year increase. However, compared to the fourth quarter of the previous year, there was a modest increase of 3.7% in the revenue driven by enterprise and broadband revenues. The company has successfully implemented cost-saving measures, resulting in a decrease of 0.6% in operational expenditure, excluding depreciation and amortization compared to Q1 in 2023. This was partly due to the decrease in dollar-denominated expenses such as annual maintenance cost, international settlement and internet backbone charges due to the rupee appreciation. The first quarter of 2024 presented a volatile business landscape with macroeconomic factors impacting the top-line performance. However, SLT Mobitel swiftly implemented strategic cost optimization measures which enabled the company to realize significant operational cost savings of 2.7% at the group level. In a testament to their enduring partnership, Signature has once again teamed up with Sri Lanka Cricket as the official formal clothing partner for the ICC Men's T20 World Cup 2024. Building on their past collaborations, this renewed alliance signifies the mutual trust and shared commitment to excellence between both the entities. The company previously served as the clothing sponsor for the Cricket World Cup in 1996 and the T20 World Cup in 2014, both victorious tournaments for Sri Lanka. As the Sri Lankan cricket men's team embarks on their journey to the USA, they carry with them the confidence and style provided by Signature Apparels. 
with ICC Men's T20 World Cup 2024 set to commence on the 1st of June and Sri Lanka and South Africa game taking place on the 3rd of June, the team is poised to make strong impression on the global stage. A recent event organized by the Ceylon Motor Trading Association themed Mobility and Economic Growth brought together key stakeholders and thought leaders to delve into crucial discussions shaping Sri Lanka's economic landscape. The event, highlighted by a keynote speech from Mr. Katsuki Kotaro, Minister and Deputy Head of Mission at the Embassy of Japan, and a dynamic panel discussion, provided invaluable insights and strategies for sustainable growth and enhanced mobility. Mr. Kotaro emphasized Sri Lanka's significant strides in economic recovery since the challenges of 2022. He explained that Sri Lanka's economy has rebounded since 2022 with steady growth rates approaching the 3% target for 2024. Inflation, previously at 70%, has dropped to 2.5% though prices remain high. Good Life X announced the launch of the Creative Catalyst Fellowship at Trace Expert City yesterday. The program, funded by the US government's development arm, the United States Agency for International Development, seeks innovative solutions to social issues, harnessing the power of creatives to raise awareness, mobilize resources, and advocate for positive change. Through a seven-month fellowship, fellows will confront norms and advocate for change. Thematic cohorts, beginning with this year's focus on climate action and sustainability, will offer tailored opportunities for fellows to contribute to dialogue and narratives that can positively affect Sri Lanka's future. Applications are now open for this year's cohort. The program seeks experienced creative people from a variety of disciplines, including fine arts, digital arts, photography, film, crafts, performing arts and more. Moving on to a commercial break, global updates on the other side. This is the Nile Business Report. Welcome back to the Nile Business Report. Global stocks eased today after Federal Reserve officials hinted US interest rates may not fall anytime soon. Japan's Nikkei fell 0.48%, while China's stocks grinded higher, with the blue chip gauge gaining 0.15% in early trading. Shanghai Shenzhen CSI 300 and Shanghai Composite fell about 0.2% as a flurry of economic readings presented a mixed outlook for Asia's biggest economy. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index was the bright spot for Asia, rising 0.77% and touching its highest since August 2023. Australia's ASX 200 fell 0.6% as concerns over China weighed on major mining and consumer stocks. South Korea's Kospi lost 0.8% while futures for India's Nifty 50 Index pointed to a weak open. The Japanese economy shrank at an annual rate of 2% in the first quarter of this year, as consumption and exports declined, the government said yesterday. Although unemployment has stayed relatively low in the world's fourth largest economy at about 2.6%, wage growth has been slow and prices have risen partly due to weakness of the yen against the US dollar. For more on this, we have other than a nightly business report special correspondent Rasita Chandradasa joining us from Tokyo, Japan. The BOJ announced the, the Japanese GDP stats yesterday and it came as a little shocker for the markets. Even though the people ex expected the real GDP to be contracted around 1% compared to the last quarter, nobody expected it to be contracted by 2%, which was the results announced by the BOJ. Even though the actual nominal GDP is growing, uh, this shows the inflation is a huge issue. Even though the wages are increasing and uh, the prices are going up, but this inflation is impacting the actual day-to-day -day life of uh, Japanese people. So this contraction of 2%, uh, the quota wise, means that the BOG would have a hard time implementing their rates 
the rate hikes which we expected to happen uh, probably another one or two times this year might take a pause because any rate hike would actually impact uh, inflation and makes life much harder. And don't forget that this is an election year. So Prime Minister Kishida-san has this in mind because the ruling LDP already took a blow and they are expected not to win actually. Maybe even, even if they win, it's going to be a very tight fight between the opposition. So in the election year, he must control the inflation as well as he must show the people the economy is good. It, it's not just the figures, even not just the figures, actual the feelings of the Japanese people has to be confident, has to be positive. So we all, uh, every, every move the Prime Minister makes and every move BOG makes is closely watched within a couple of weeks or up to the election. On U.S. stocks now, the Dow reached an intraday high of 40,000 for the first time as investor hopes of interest rate cuts by the Federal Reserve were buoyed by data showing an inflation slowdown as well as strong corporate earnings. The Dow Jones Industrial Average reached an intraday high of 40,000 for the first time on Thursday as investor hopes of interest rate cuts by the Federal Reserve were buoyed by data showing an inflation slowdown as well as strong corporate earnings. But after pairing earlier gains, the blue chip index ended down one-tenth of a percent, the S&P 500 fell two-tenths, and the Nasdaq slipped a quarter of a percent. All three major indexes notched record closes in the previous session after a smaller-than-expected rise in consumer prices fueled optimism that inflation resumed its downward trend after three months of hotter-than-expected readings. Traders are back to betting on two quarter-point interest rate cuts by the Federal Reserve this year, with a 70% chance of the first reduction coming in September, according to the CME FedWatch tool. Stocks on the move included Walmart, which added nearly 7% after topping profit and sales forecasts for its fiscal first quarter and raising its full-year guidance. Shares of Deer fell nearly 5%, after the farm equipment maker trimmed its annual profit forecast for the second time. Netflix said its ad supported tier had hit 40 million global monthly active users, a sign the firm's push to draw new users with a cheaper plan has paid off. This jump comes at a time when the streaming companies face tough competition. Netflix said Wednesday its ad supporter tier has hit 40 million global monthly active users. That's way up from 5 million a year earlier. And it's a sign the firm's push to draw new users with the cheaper plan has paid off. The jump comes at a time when streaming companies face tough competition. Many have brought in bundles with their rivals to retain subscribers. Netflix launched the ad supported plan a year and a half ago. Data from a leading research firm this week showed such an approach has drawn users. It said the majority of gross subscriber additions for the streaming industry came from ad-supported plans for the first time in the fourth quarter. Netflix also said it will launch an in-house advertising technology platform by the end of next year. That's in a bid to offer clients new ways to buy ads and better engage with users. Netflix's ad tier plan costs $6.99 per month in the US undercutting many rivals, including Disney+. Plus. China's factory output topped forecasts in April, helped by improving external demand, although retail sales unexpectedly slowed and the property sector remained a drag on the economy, piling pressure on Beijing to do more to support growth. Figures out Friday told two very different stories on China's economy. The country's factories seem to be getting busier. Industrial output grew 6.7% on the year in April. That was up on the month before and beat analyst forecasts. It comes after earlier numbers showed exports returning to growth last month and suggests a recovery is gathering pace for manufacturers. But it's a very different outlook for the country's ailing property sector. New home prices fell at their fastest pace in over nine years in April. They were down 0.6% on the month. That all comes despite Beijing's efforts to revive the sector, which accounts for about a fifth of the economy. 
Recent media reports suggest officials could now require local governments to buy unsold homes in a bid to stabilise the market. The crisis in the sector dates back to 2021, when watchdogs started to crack down on the massive debts racked up by some developers. A string of major property firms have since defaulted on their debts or gone under, leaving millions of homes unfinished or unsold. On Friday, a Hong Kong court adjourned a liquidation hearing for major developer Country Garden, giving it more time to show it's making progress on restructuring efforts. With that, we wrap up our final bulletin for this week's Nile Business Report. We'll see you again next week with the hopes of getting you the latest on the business world. I'm Sina Maya Dune. Have a great weekend and good night.